start to introduce about the wing family and uh, the reason for it, uh, honoring them. And then we'll introduce our uh, wonderful speaker, uh, Dr. Elisa Choi. But let me start with introducing the uh, Wing family first. So uh, Larry and Evelyn Wing uh, was uh, a trustee of Jocelyn. Oh, can I go to the next slide, please? And uh, uh, with the support from uh, the list of people who are on this slide now, this uh, lectureship was formed and endowed about four years ago. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Larry and Evelyn Wing uh, were the uh, on the board of trustee of Jocelyn for many, many years. And uh, due to uh, their support, uh, uh, Jocelyn uh, uh, formulated uh, its uh, Asian diabetes effort. And, uh, uh, and this has continued with his, uh, with their children. Uh, it's a show picture here, Linda Wing, Dr. Lauren Wing and uh, Leverett Wing. Uh, I think uh, uh, they are on the uh, a call today. As I see, we have over a thousand, uh, over a hundred, I'm sorry, uh, uh, attendee to this, uh, lectureship already. Next slide, please. So here it shows the two uh, picture and uh, here we have uh, some of the founders of Asian American Diabetes uh, in, uh, Initiative uh, and uh, the, some of the founders uh, on the picture on the left uh, and uh, uh, the Evelyn and uh, Larry Wing is in this picture. Uh, as well as uh, 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 Levert and Marianne and uh, uh, the Wongs and uh, uh, Diana and myself uh, at one of the early gatherings. The host, the other family uh, was is not on here and Dr. Jing, Jing, Jeannie Chen is also uh, in this picture. On the right are the members of the uh, ADI team as uh, we have now, which stations uh, the Asian clinic, advocacy, education and research arms and their list of names. Next slide, please. Now with their endowment of this wonderful lectureship, uh, uh, which every year is focused on public health and Asian American health, uh, especially with focus on diabetes. And this is a list of the previous speakers who are, are leaders in Asian American and health, uh, 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 even today, as shown here. Uh, next slide, please. Now, today, uh, we have the great honor to have Dr. Elisa Choi, uh, who is, uh, whose credential I'll briefly mention earlier, uh, later uh, as a 2021 lecturer. Her topic is going to be anti-Asian racism and COVID-19 pandemic in parallel. This is certainly a very, very important topic uh, at this moment uh, because both of these issues is uh, incredibly, uh, have a great impact on the Asian community as well as on the general uh, country in, in, in this country at this time. Next slide, please. Dr. Elisha Choi uh, is from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, residency at Bez, Bez Israel Deaconess Hospital and chief residence there. And is now the uh, faculty at Harvard Medical School. And she's a specialist in infectious disease. She's been, she's a governor of Massachusetts chapter American College of Physicians and is a chair elect of the governor of, of the whole country of ACP and first Asian American woman to hold the position. She uh, 
is the past chair of the Asian American Commission, Commission for the state of Massachusetts and still a member. And she's also a member of the Massachusetts Department of Health COVID-19 Health Advisory Equity Group. And she certainly is um, uh, uh, qualified and eminent leader in both of the issues that, uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Next. Now, uh, slight digression is that this is the Asian American month, the May. Uh, in May is the Asian American Diabetes Month, and we have multiple activity going on in, uh, uh, at Joslin. One is the 16th Taste of Ginger event to, to raise money and celebrate uh, Asian American Month. Uh, that's on coming Sunday, the uh, 16th. I hope everybody buy tickets and support us. And in addition, we'll be releasing or have released uh, our new Diabetes Prevention and Management a Guide for Asian Americans. And this is developed by the AADI team in multiple languages, uh, English, Chinese, traditional and simplified Japanese, Korean, and so forth. So please take a look. So next slide, please. So let me uh, introduce again, uh, Dr. Elisa Choi, who will speak on the Asian American racism and COVID-19 pandemic in parallel. That's a choice. Thank you so much, Dr. King. And I am so honored and grateful to you and to Levert Wing and the Wing family and to Jocelyn Diabetes, Asian American Diabetes Initiative. Uh, Dr. King is a personal mentor and hero, medical hero of mine. And to be asked by him and, and this, uh, organization to speak is a true honor. I wanted to acknowledge at the outset that this talk will be slightly different than perhaps what this audience is used to because of the nature of what we're in right now, which is the worst pandemic our society has experienced perhaps in our lifetime. But I do promise that we will have a chance to talk briefly about diabetes. And I want to thank uh, the Asian American Diabetes Initiative for spotlighting and supporting the important needs of our community uh, for diabetes and also to highlight what still needs to be done to make our community healthy. So a few housekeeping points. I have no disclosures and let me spotlight a few of the learning objectives that I hope all of you will come away with at the end of this talk. I hope that you'll find some information useful about how COVID-19 intersects with this current, what I call dual pandemic of anti-Asian racism. And then I'd like to also summarize where things are for our community with respect to COVID-19. And as fitting of the title of these pandemic in parallel, I'd like to also uh, really uh, bear down on what is happening with this other awful pandemic of anti-Asian racism. And then to finish at the end, to talk about health disparities more generally in honor of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and also to acknowledge the work that Asian American Diabetes Initiative does in such an important way for our community with respect to diabetes. So let's take a step back. We're well into the pandemic now, but if we try to remember when this all started, this is a timeline of COVID-19. And the first case really came to light at the end of December of 2019, when WHO started hearing about a cluster of pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan in China. And it was some type of a viral pneumonia. And at that point, most of us here in the US were fairly, uh, I, I think, uh, comfortable with our daily lives, then the, and the, the COVID-19 pandemic hadn't yet hit our shores. In fact, it hadn't even been named. So what I'd like to do then is do a deep dive and evaluate the pathophysiology of COVID-19. Now, clearly the scope of this talk won't have enough time to go into a lot of detail, but just so we're all on the same page, I did wanna make sure to spotlight a few summary points. COVID-19, as has been ultimately named, is the 
constellation of findings and clinical symptoms that are caused by a coronavirus, specifically SARS-CoV-2, which is a respiratory RNA virus. And initially, while this was thought to primarily involve the respiratory system, it is very clear at this point now that it is a really dangerous virus that causes multi-organ involvement. And some of the risk factors for more severe disease with COVID-19 include chronic diseases of multiple organ systems, including cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, hematologic, kidney, liver, lung, neurologic systems, and also other risk factors, including diabetes. Transmission, while initially it was unclear how much a role of fomite and non-person-to-person -person transmission played, as the data is emerging, it's clear that primary mode is person-to-person. -person. And of note, just this past Friday, the CDC spotlighted that aerosol as well as droplet transmission is primarily the root. And importantly, for those of us who have the privilege of having been vaccinated, there is a vaccine now. There's several platforms of vaccine. And we are in a very uh, significant race right now to try and get as many of us vaccinated so we can reach that, that holy grail of herd immunity before COVID-19 starts to create another wave of significant infections. So where are we now with COVID-19? Just to fill us in on our update currently, from the most recent dashboard data from the Mass DPH, we have these figures here, about 655 new confirmed cases and a total of approximately 650,000. And in terms of where we are with our infectivity, importantly, we are much reduced than when we were at the height of our last surge. We're down to about a 1.24% po positivity. What we can be proud of in Massachusetts, although I will say we still have a lot more work to do, is we're in the top three states in getting um, our community members and our citizens vaccinated. And at this point, approximately 60% of those of us in Massachusetts have had at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. We're in the top three along with Hawaii and Vermont. Now, the US is a, a slightly different picture because there's definitely an uneven pattern of distribution of those states that are doing as well as, as we may be with respect to vaccinations. At this juncture, we are almost 33 million cases and tragically more than 500, 580,000 deaths and at this juncture, we're not quite at 50% of, um, of our population getting at least one dose. So what's happening and what's the current wave that we're addressing? The biggest concern now, I alluded to the race to get people vaccinated. We are trying to vaccinate as many as we can so that we can get enough people protected so that we can try to slow down infection before variant COVID-19 strains take hold. And those of you who may be keeping up with the COVID-19 literature may be aware of numerous different variants. Going into specific details of those is not quite the focus of this talk, but I will show this particular graphic from the CDC. And if you look at Massachusetts, currently of the samples that we are able to send to the CDC, uh, the percentage of those that have been sequenced to be consistent with the B117, which is the UK variant, is approximately 44%. The second most predominant COVID-19 variant is the P1 variant, which arises out of Brazil. And then the third most common is actually a paired group of variants, B1427 and B1429, both emerging out of California. Now, each of these variants have different characteristics. Some of them have a significantly increased transmission and or severity. Some of them have uh, reduced effect, efficacy and susceptibility to monoclonal antibodies. Suffice to say, this is an evolving picture. And what I showed you is perhaps already outdated by later today or tomorrow. So this is a rapidly evolving picture. Now, I can't talk about COVID-19 oh, without mentioning what is tragically happening to our uh, fellow uh, Pan-Asian community members in India. As all of you may be hearing, it is incredibly devastating how they have been hit. 
I wanted to show you these graphics to show just how severe the situation is and how dire the conditions are there. So if you take a look here from data just from the other day, they are approximately having about 400,000 400, new cases a day and on order of between 3,500 to almost approaching 4,000 new deaths a day. And there's definitely some emerging data that may suggest part of why India is suffering so significantly is the potential for a variant called the B1617 variant. It is still very much debated how much of an impact that variant is having compared to the other known variants that are currently circulating in India, which include the UK variant and also which may include the um, variant coming out of um, South Africa. So at this juncture, it's very much also a developing picture. Now, before I go on, I will also acknowledge that it's not just India, much of South Asia, including Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives, as well as portions of Southeast Asia are really also getting hit very hard right now in this current wave of COVID-19. And in Southeast Asia, specifically Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, um, it, remarkably, Vietnam has been a bit of a, a haven of uh, protection, but uh, clearly this is a global pandemic and we are still not done with the fight against this infection. So what about my theme here of pandemic parallels? Let me put up a timeline that I've adapted from a report that was put out for the proceedings of the 30th web conference. This is somewhat um, useful to think about because as I go into more detail about the anti-Asian racism pandemic, it's not insignificant the timing of some financial and trade deals that the US had made with China just prior to when the first reported case uh, was acknowledged by WHO. So what I wanted to also um, indicate here is that not just China, but in, uh, Italy was also significantly affected very early on. And what's very interesting and perhaps predictable, and I'll go into the reasons why, is Italy didn't seem to have the same stigma of COVID-19 as what happened with China and Asian um, individuals. And we'll talk about the root causes and, and the quote unquote pathophysiology of that in more detail. I had to put this up here because this was the first uh, use of Chinese virus on Twitter by the former president. And while we were definitely hearing about anti-Asian racism and violence and targeting before the former president stated this, it is irrefutable. And this report that I highlighted here has the data to show that there was an incredible spike in all types of racial epithets and anti-Asian um, uh, derogatory terms hitting social media and the mass media after the former president made it very public that he was calling it the Chinese virus. So as physicians, we like to think about pathophysiology and I discussed very briefly the pathophysiology of COVID-19. What about the second pandemic of anti-Asian racism? What's the pathophysiology there? I'm gonna to touch on several of these causes and, and root causes, if you will, of the pathophysiology of anti-Asian racism. The yellow peril theme or the perpetual other or foreigner, the myth of the model minority, and how anti-Asian racism has really become truly a viral, uh, a viral condition in its own right. And what about transmission? Well, unfortunately, there can be some element of person-to-person -person transmission too, and that's something that we hopefully will be able to turn the tide against. So I put this up because uh, the date of this particular event is, is interesting. This was when um, as a former member of the Asian American Commission, I had the uh, privilege to be asked to speak out against anti-Asian racism at its very early outset. And we had the opportunity to hold a press conference. And as you can see, this was so early, we hadn't even started wearing masks yet. This was March 12th. And if you recall, uh, the former president had tweeted Chinese virus on March 16th. Uh, 
So as I alluded to, we were already hearing terrible stories of uh, individuals of Asian descent who were being shunned, discriminated, attacked. And mind you, it wasn't just happening in the US. There was a teen in California who was beaten up by fellow high schoolers because they thought he was a carrier. Uh, there were a couple Hmong uh, individuals uh, who were denied a hotel room at um, a Super 8. There were also incidences that were arising globally in Europe, in Canada, individuals of Asian descent who were being targeted and being uh, really uh, attacked because of their Asian background. So while it's very easy to blame the former administration we have to acknowledge this problem of anti-Asian racism goes far deeper and unfortunately has much more uh, deep roots than just the most recent presidential administration. And importantly, the fact that COVID-19 became racialized so early was deeply problematic. Part of what we were all speaking out about at this press conference is in fact, how just because one is Asian, that does not mean that we are actually any more likely to have a risk of either carrying COVID-19, transmitting it, or being an infectious reservoir of this very deadly virus. And I was also fortunate at uh, the outset of this pandemic uh, over a year ago to have an editorial published along with other colleagues from the American College of Physicians in this piece that spotlighted the quote viral epidemic of anti-Asian racism and really made a strong appeal that we need to use data and medical evidence and not give in to race baiting and uh, racial hysteria, which has unfortunately happened in our past history in this country to uh, deal with the pandemic as it was emerging. Now, what about one of the elements of the quote pathophysiology of COVID of anti-Asian anti -Asian racism that I alluded to? This concept of the yellow peril. This uh, very uh, offensive cartoon was actually a racist French satire that's showing the Chinese it depicted here being hunted because they are quote a yellow peril. And uh, that's exactly what this is titled. I don't speak French, but I, I know enough to know that this specifically means the yellow peril. And the whole term of yellow peril was really coined at the turn of the century of the 20th century by um, Emperor Wil Wilhelm II of Germany, who basically at that time had commissioned a painting to essentially depict how the Europeans would defend their quote, civilized nations against the barbarian Asians. And this term has unfortunately perpetuated uh, subsequent to its initial use as a way to uh, stigmatize and also to target our Asian community members. And the notion of being a yellow peril really is rooted in this concept of white European um, dominance uh, and fearfulness against Asians who they feared might conquer them or may, um, be, uh, may take them as a conquest. So this actually has unfortunately persisted to this day. And during disease outbreaks subsequent to the initial uh, coining of this term, such as when there was uh, uh, outbreaks of bubonic plague um, or other uh, types of infections, it's always a marginalized group that is targeted. And in this case, as Asians, we were marginalized. So targeting marginalized groups such as Asians is not a new phenomenon. And COVID-19 only resurfaced what had actually been happening to our community for centuries. The notion of casting Asian bodies as diseased um, or as um, our customs or foods or our behaviors as uh, somehow unsanitary. All of this is deeply rooted in European um, dominance and colonialism and unfortunately perpetuates to this day. And this notion of the yellow peril has actually led to a 
targeting of our community in other ways. And unfortunately that has manifest in our past history in the US with, um, with events like the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Acts. The first, the first time an entire ethnicity and race was excluded solely. And again, targeting occurring when there was a perceived threat to the white European dominance. Um, interestingly, uh, this has perpetuated to this day, despite a much more, uh, uh, I think, knowledgeable awareness of racial dynamics, uh, even in mass media, stand-up comedians, sitcoms, uh, movies, television, still find it permissible to joke about Asian customs, Asian foods, to joke about uh, Asians as uh, not really being Americans or having an accent all the time. And that unfortunately contributes significantly to this pandemic of anti-Asian racism. What's left out unfortunately is the history of our community as significant contributors to substantial contributions to our society. For example, the Transcontinental Railroad. And um, it's not just in the 19th century either. We all uh, likely are well aware of the uh, really uh, terrible um, detention and detainment of Japanese American uh, individuals around the World War II. And remember, these were Americans, American citizens who happened to be of Japanese descent, who were against their will, involuntarily contained and detained in centers and concentration camps because of racial war hysteria and fear of the other or the perpetual foreigner. So almost on the flip side of the yellow peril and the perpetual foreigner and the othering is another trope that is part of the pathophysiology of anti-Asian racism, the so-called model minority myth. And uh, while there are some in the Asian community and the Pan-Asian um, uh, community that may agree with some aspects of it, my argument here is that this is just a different side to the root cause of anti-Asian racism. The model minority myth, first and foremost, was never something that we as a community created. It was coined, again, at a time when there was concern about our community, particularly as World War II uh, was ending and Japanese Americans were reintegrating after all of the uh, detention centers and internment camps, and they were starting to become part of mainstream US society again, there was actually the coining of model minority in an article in the New York Times Magazine in the mid 1960s, holding up Japanese Americans as a success story. What has been so dangerous, insidious and undesirable about this myth of the model minority is that A, it assumes all Asians are a monolith, and I'll go into how that's absolutely incorrect in a future uh, portion of the talk. And it also sets us up as uh, part of a hierarchy of racial and ethnic groups. In other words, we are on the hierarchy to the white supreme um, ladder of being a white European. And it also defines Asians as docile, obedient, quiet, and unlikely to rebel. And that only serves to reinforce the notion that we need to be submissive to a dominant hierarchy of a racial structure. Unfortunately, it also has implications for our health. And I'll go into that uh, later in the talk as well. But the notion that Asians are healthier because we're again, a model minority, and it also renders uh, and obliterates the differences within our very heterogeneous community by saying that we all are better educated and wealthier when in fact Asians and Asian Americans have the biggest income disparity within a racial ethnic group of any other racial group. We also have one of the biggest disparities in education with some subgroups of the Pan-Asian community having very high rates of post high school education and other subgroups within our community having some of the lowest of the entire uh, country. So it is really dangerous and it's very, very damaging to all of us. So let's get 
a demographic update, much like I gave you an update of COVID-19 numbers, where are we at with the anti-Asian racism pandemic numbers? Here's a very helpful series of data slides from Stop AAPI Hate, which is a website that has been a clearinghouse and um, a place that all sorts of anti-Asian racism and violence and um, discrimination incidences are being collected. I won't go through each and every single graph, but I wanted to spotlight a couple things here that there's a large percentage of discrimination and anti-Asian racism manifesting as verbal harassment, although we are all certainly aware of the awful, terrible, violent attacks that we've seen. Most recently, just last week, where two elderly Asian women were brutally attacked and knifed out of the blue in broad daylight while waiting for uh, mass transportation in San Francisco. And of course, uh, for many of us, including myself, it was incredibly emotionally disturbing when the shooters um, were uh, murdering their victims in Atlanta with the spa shootings where six Asian women were targeted and shot. And also, unfortunately, a similar type of mass shooting happening in Indianapolis with uh, members of our community who are Sikh who are also shot. So this is a really devastating pandemic at this point. The numbers, unfortunately, are just through the roof. And the numbers, this was a report that Stop AAPI Hate just released late last week. So this is fresh data. And the numbers are over 6,600 of these types of anti-Asian racism cases. And here, just again, to spotlight briefly that it's predominantly East Asian, mostly Chinese. But remember that all of these numbers, the caveat is that many will not report, particularly those who are limited English proficiency are unlikely to report. And there's so much fear in members of our community that some may not even want to report. So it's widely understood that these numbers are significantly an underestimate of where we really are. Here's a few other statistics I wanted to highlight with the anti-Asian racism pandemic update. The percentage of respondents who um, mentioned that they had been victimized by anti-Asian racism, it is alarming how much of the percentage are women. Two thirds are women. And while you see this breakdown in ages that seems to suggest younger adults, again, I would also caution you that it's very likely, particularly in our older community members, that they are not reporting these cases. So much of this is probably an underestimation. And then here I direct your attention to the breakdown by states where there have been cases of anti-Asian racism reported. And notably, by, by far, the largest number of cases thus far have been reported in California. So I wanna shift gears a little bit. And as physicians, we talk about pandemics, we talk about pathophysiology and understanding the root causes of our diseases. Uh, but we also like to focus on how we can treat and cure. So for the pandemic of anti-Asian racism, I wanted to spotlight for a minute uh, my organization that I'm part of. And I will also give a caveat that much of what I'm saying is not as a representative officially of ACP, but I am proud to acknowledge that ACP took a stand and actually supported very strongly Rep. Representative Grace Meng from New York's resolution um, 908 that was condemning all forms of anti-Asian sentiment. And ACP specifically has been a true leader in anti-Asian um, hate and racism as well as anti-racism in general. And I will add that uh, without getting overly partisan um, because everyone has different political beliefs, unfortunately, while this pandemic has become racialized, it has also become highly politicized and politically charged. And I will add that the, re the resolution of, that Grace Meng had proposed last year passed, but it was interesting that of all of the uh, members of Congress who voted to oppose it, they were all a member of one party. And I will just add that it's the party that is not currently in the White House. So this is unfortunately becoming politicized and also is becoming a bit of a partisan issue when it really shouldn't be because this is a pandemic 
that affects all of us. I'll also spotlight some quote unquote treatments or therapies for this anti-Asian racism. And that's um, a recent executive order that the current president has placed. I won't read through it all, but this was really welcome to see. And it signifies that at the highest office of government in our country, it's unacceptable right now to target members of our Asian community with violence and racism and bias. So um, let me ask all of you, this is not a true audience response, but if all of, if any of you on this, on this talk are Asian or of Asian descent, I wanna congratulate you on the superpower of being invisible and obviously I'm being facetious, but it is all too true that as Asian and Asian Americans, we are literally invisible, particularly when it comes to data and our health. And I cite this particular study uh, from a Twitter friend actually. And this is not, we're not talking 30, 40 years ago. This is something published by no less than the American Cancer Society in 2017. It certainly struck my eye and hopefully does yours as well, the complete and utter absence of any data about our community, the Pan-Asian community. And that is not um, a trivial omission. Here's some data about our community right now. And I will add that we are currently, as the Pan-Asian community, the largest, uh, uh, pardon me, the fastest growing racial ethnic group across all race and ethnic groups. And we are at approximately, 19 million or approximately 6% of the US population. But by the year 2050, we're estimated to reach approximately 14 or 15%. And so to leave us out is absolutely um, really not acceptable. So some data, and I, I do want to, to pivot a little bit and mention that while we need more data, we need any data, and not the excuse that the data is not sufficient or that we are not statistically significant. But we also can see when you look at the breakdown from the 2020 census of the Asian community, just how many variations there are and subgroups there are. And so the Pan-Asian community in the US right now represents almost 50 different racial uh, ethnic nationalities and upwards of maybe even a hundred different languages. And so there's no unifying language and so many different cultural backgrounds. It really begs the question, how can any aggregate data actually be accurate? We'll come to that in a few more slides. I also put up here for your reference where we are in Massachusetts currently. And of note, um, we do have small numbers of some of the subgroups. And so that speaks to the whole concept of us being an Asian American community. And um, a little bit of history, uh, I'm not a historian, but I think it's notable that the term Asian American in a sense was a political creation from the 1960s that enabled us as a community to gain some political voice, because as you can see, otherwise, our numbers are quite small relative to the larger community. That has some political advantages, but it can also be disadvantageous when we need to address disparities within our larger Pan-Asian community. And again, I'll address that in a few more slides. So let me pivot again and talk now about COVID-19 deaths and data that we have on our Asian community in aggregate. And um, that's what we have right now. So we can at least look at aggregate Asian data. And what I'll show you here from this report that came out of um, MMWR in the fall is if you look at the percent change in the weekly number of deaths in 2020, and this was looking at mostly early 2020, compared to the preceding five years, you'll see almost all the communities of color the blue line shows a higher percentage of death relative to what was seen the five years preceding. So what was the big difference in 2020? Well, obviously COVID-19 and the pandemic. So these are um, taken to be excess or um, additional deaths that are related to the pandemic. And shown in a different way are some graphs here, which I'll go through quickly for the sake of time, but to spotlight for the entire US from data from AAPI data and the sources of Marshall Project, you can see here that 
despite Asians and the Pan-Asian community often being invisible in data and also invisible in conversations related to health disparities, including with COVID-19, we are right up there with excess deaths uh, relative to the preceding five years compared to the other communities of color. And you break it down in terms of states, we absolutely are suffering also from excess deaths due to COVID-19 in, in the Commonwealth. And then briefly here, showing you that Massachusetts, as of the first half of 2020 data collected by this uh, data consortium, we are third only to New York and New Jersey in terms of the percentage of increased excess Asian American deaths compared to the preceding five years. Now, in the next series of slides, I'm going to talk about current data based on a, um, uh, a survey of studies, a survey study from EPIC. And for those of you who, who don't know, EPIC is the electronic health record that many health systems use, and also from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And there was an analysis of various types of COVID-19 related data slices amongst a lot of different sites where there were patients that they were able to survey in terms of COVID-19 information. So I'll briefly go through these slides just to give you a sense of the current landscape of Asian and Asian American COVID-19 data. So what you can see here in this first figure is testing rate among the different ethnicities. And note that all of these data slides in the forthcoming slides are statistically significant. So what I spotlight here for you is Asian testing for COVID-19 is far below any of the other communities. And why is that important? Well, if we're not getting tested, we first off don't know exactly what the true rate of COVID-19 may be. And it probably also speaks to a significant degree of fear and stigma about how racialized COVID-19 was to our community. And this is something that I'm also seeing locally in my own institution. So we need to factor that in when we're talking about health disparities and COVID-19. And now what about some of the other data? If you look here on this figure, this is talking about positive COVID-19 test rates among the different ethnicities. And what you can see here is that Asians also have statistically significant higher COVID-19 test rates compared to white and on par with some of the other communities of color. In this figure, what is of note is the different colors of the bar graph shows the different stages of level of care at the time patients of the different ethnicities present as COVID positive. And what's interesting is compared to white, all of the communities of color had COVID-19 diagnosed at later stages or perhaps more severe stages in the inpatient setting, in the dark blue, and in the lighter blue, inpatient settings with significant severe disease requiring oxygen or ventilatory support. And again, these are all statistically significant. Let me go through a few more of these quickly. In this figure, you'll see COVID-19 cases that were active um, cases uh, that were looked at um, among positive cases per 10,000. And again, you can see Asians are right up there along with the other communities of color and substantially statistically higher than the white community. And this is hospitalization and death rates. And again, we're not often talked about the Asian American community as suffering more significant deaths or hospitalizations, but the data is right here and we are definitely higher than the white community. And what about hospitalization and deaths for those who tested positive for COVID-19? So our community, interestingly, has the highest rates here. So these are significant. And in terms of what, what that means, we're often left out, or as I said, rendered invisible in these conversations. And some of this merging data really points to how important it is that we're part of those conversations. Now, uh, this is a diabetes institution and a diabetes talk, and I really appreciate everyone's forbearance that I haven't focused so much on diabetes, but I do want to point out a few things. As I alluded to in one of my earliest slides, diabetes is a significant risk factor for severe COVID-19. And while the exact pathophysiology of that is um, somewhat speculative, it is known that diabetes is a risk for more severe infection overall, and certainly hyperglycemia can affect the immune response. So 
it is of note that something that is emerging is perhaps this relationship is not just one way, as in diabetes leads to more severe COVID-19, but can COVID-19 be a risk factor for diabetes? So the data is emerging and it's still quite early, but there are some reports that I have cited here that suggest that COVID-19 might have some implication for uh, a risk factor for a new diagnosis of diabetes. Now, mind you that the mechanism for this is also still under investigation, speculation that perhaps COVID-19 as a respiratory virus that causes multi-organ system damage might have some effect on damaging pancreatic beta cells. It's all still under investigation, but we do want to keep a close eye on this because like many other things that we are learning about COVID-19, this could end up becoming quite significant. And in these two smaller studies that I cited, the first of which that was an accelerated article preview in Nature, it was looking at the VA health system and particularly looking at COVID-19 patients who were outpatients who were survivors and approximately 39% more of the COVID-19 positive survivors had a new diabetes diagnosis within six months after infection. In the second study I cited out of a BMJ, this was actually in hospitalized patients. It was noted that COVID-19 positive patients who were hospitalized were approximately 50% more likely to have a new diagnosis of diabetes within five months after hospital discharge. So pivoting a little bit now, I had alluded to data, how important data is, not just for COVID and anti-Asian racism and diabetes and other health conditions, but just in general, getting the data specific and accurate. And here um, uh, is uh, actually now at this point, three years ago, uh, I had the privilege along with Representative Taki Chan, who is a leader of our uh, Massachusetts Congressional Caucus, uh, Asian Caucus, and also Dr. George King himself to testify on behalf of a bill that was advocating for accurate data for Asian for Asian data for Asian. This bill was actually several uh, iterations ago, and I will say that there is now a new iteration of the bill, and it is in the current congressional session. It's actually H three one one three one one five, and there's been some significant improvements to the original bill, where it incorporates the need for specificity, not just of the Asian community, but all communities. And while that remains under evaluation and deliberation by the Massachusetts um, legislature, um, it is something of significant importance that we need to address. Now in this preprint, so again, this now is information that has not yet been peer reviewed, which is the big caveat, but this is a uh, fairly recently released preprint data that shows disaggregated data of COVID-19 outcomes. And I point you specifically to the statistically significant outcome, which is odds of death among hospitalized patients. This was preprint evaluation of a study of New York public hospitals and COVID-19 cases. So if you look here specifically in the Chinese subgroup, with a statistically significant p-value, the odds of death among these hospitalized patients with COVID-19, it was a higher odds ratio and uh, odds of death in specifically the Chinese community. And here's how you can see that there is disaggregation that makes a difference. If you look at the different color coding, all Asian is purple, dark purple. Here it is when you're looking at outcomes of death, and you look at Chinese specifically disaggregated, you can see how substantially higher it is. So again, while this is not peer reviewed and it is a preprint article, it makes a case that we need to have accurate, specific, disaggregated data. So I'm gonna briefly talk now about health disparities as Asian health disparities alone could be its own hour long talk. But I will note that the reason it's so important for accurate data is also because if you look at the different subgroups, you may see very different snapshots of what's happening. So here I point to in the top left corner, coverage of uninsured Asian um, Americans and the national average of insurance coverage is here at this line. You can see specifically when you disaggregate Vietnamese American and Korean American, 
how they're much higher than some of the other subgroups all the way here at the left, Japanese American. And so the disaggregation is not just important for health outcomes, but even for health insurance coverage. There are other health disparities here, which I won't go into too much detail, but just spotlight that Asian women don't get routine mammograms nearly as much in terms of prevention as other, um, other women in other communities. And also similarly with routine pap smears, HIV and AIDS testing is often less in our community. And also, unfortunately, we had the least percentage of us seeing a physician within the past year, and we have significant limited English proficiency in our community. So what about health disparities overall? Well, spotlighting again that the month of May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. We really need to think about not just spotlighting our accomplishments, but also putting a light on what we need to do to further advance all of us in our Pan-Asian community. I will also mention Mental Health Awareness Month is the month of May, and we have significant health disparities with respect to mental health in our community. That talk can also be a separate talk in an hour, but I will point out a few things that recently I had seen a statistic that among Asians in the age 15 to 24 age range, we have the highest rates of suicide. And that is a really tragic figure. We also have uh, approximately 70% of Southeast Asian refugees are being diagnosed when they come to care with, with a post-traumatic stress disorder. And unfortunately, as with many things um, that are affiliated with mental health awareness, mental health has such a stigma, particularly in our community, that it really becomes a challenge to even get people to come to care for their mental health. Month, uh, the month of May is also Hepatitis Awareness Month. And I spotlight that because we have a substantial and grave disparity in hepatitis in our community. While we are approximately five to 6% of the total US population, we make up upwards of 50% of chronic hepatitis and liver disease in the US. And that often gets overlooked and doesn't get enough attention. And then while it is not Diabetes Awareness Month this month, that's in November, it is a diabetes talk. And I do want to acknowledge some of the groundbreaking work that the Asian American Diabetes Initiative has done in diabetes. And I will also highlight some diabetes disparities affecting our pan-Asian community. And that um, particularly the risk of diagnosed diabetes is about 18% higher among our community members compared to non-Hispanic white adults and in subgroups in particular, it's very relevant that disaggregated, disaggregated data would spotlight that even more. For example, uh, diabetes is more than twice as high in South Asian adults compared to some East Asian adults. And so, um, and in addition, our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community members have sometimes upwards of three times greater um, the prevalence of diabetes. So, a lot of health disparities. First and foremost, we need data, but we also need specific disaggregated data. So I will pivot again back to what we can do. How do we treat these pandemics? And talking about health disparities, you know, as a physician who wants to try to treat, my goal is how do I make the situation better? There are ways to address it. And I'm very proud of American College of Physicians for putting out a policy a paper that was really looking at how to address health disparities and discrimination in healthcare. This just came out a few months ago, and that goes along with a lot of the work it does as an organization and anti-racism and calling out hate crimes. So in closing then, what can all of you do now that you know about the pathophysiology of not just COVID-19, but anti-Asian racism, and you have a sense of the health disparities affecting our community, what can you do? Advocate is one. And I, I like to reflect on this quote from uh, social anthropologist Margaret Mead, never doubt as a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. And indeed it's the only thing that ever has. And in fact, this um, group of committed citizens here were some of my colleagues at that press conference. And I'm uh, really delighted to say that this particular picture 
grabbed so much media attention that this picture now has gone viral um, many, many times over and just shows how important it is to speak up and advocate. So the take home message is here. I hope you have gotten the message that while COVID-19 and anti-Asian racism are both parallel pandemics, anti-Asian racism has been there for centuries and COVID-19 has only resurfaced what has been under the surface and in times of stress and in times of financial or um, economic crises, our community has often been targeted and continues to currently. And the yellow peril, the perpetual foreigner syndrome, the model minority myth all contribute to this anti-Asian racism. And importantly, while Asian Americans as a blanket term for all of us in the Pan-Asian community is politically advantageous in terms of garnering our numbers, it really needs to be taken with the understanding that we are not a monolith and we are in fact a very diverse and heterogeneous community in our own right. And therefore, in order to achieve health equity for all of us in our Pan-Asian community, we need accurate and specific data. So I leave you with what I hope is a, an inspiring quote from a trailblazer from the Pan-Asian community, uh, Patsy Takamoto Mink, in case you are not aware of her and her accomplishments, she was the first woman of color and the first Asian American woman elected to Congress. And she's also the author of the Title IX Amendment of Higher Education Act, which essentially uh, prohibits discrimination based on sex and gender uh, for any educational institution that receives federal government funding. So I think that that's a fitting quote from an individual who was groundbreaking in trying to achieve equity in many different ways. So with that, I leave you with my contact information and I wanted to thank you so very much for this uh, really kind invitation to speak. And I hope I've left you with some food for thought and hopefully some pearls that you may have not known before. Thank you so much. Well, thank you Dr. Choi for such a wonderful talk and hitting the highlights of all this um, important, very important point and give us some help in uh, carrying on being both Asian American and healthcare provider. Time's running late. Maybe what I'll do is uh, ask uh, Lever Wing, Mr. Wing, uh, to end for us. And uh, Lever, you have to unmute. Okay. <laughs> And, and, uh, and I'll say, Dr. King, I recognize there was a, a not as much time as we had hoped for for a conversation and, and uh, questions, but I'm happy to take questions um, if people can stay. And if not, please feel free to uh, collect them in the chat and I will do my very best to answer them. Um, I, right. I'm exceedingly grateful for the opportunity to speak. Yes. And, and thank you being a leader in our uh, community to help us. So, uh, uh, Leverett, uh, Mr. Wing. Uh, no, would you, thanks. Uh, give us the ending, and if you have a question, go ahead. No, I mean that—that that was incredible. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Choi. Um, it, uh, Elisa is a longtime friend and community partner. Um, it was heartening. It was uplifting, um, and it's heartening and uplifting to see so many of you here today. We had nearly 150 people um, on this uh, at this lectureship. Uh, bearing my my family, uh, my parents' name, and my family and I are incredibly grateful to all of you for coming. Uh, incredibly grateful to Joslyn um, for for uh, for putting this together. So often you hear um, you hear institutions saying diversity is important, the Asian American community is important, but Joslyn uh, walks the talk, and it's something that I, I I've always appreciated about Jocelyn and it's incredibly important that Jocelyn brings to the table. Thank you so much to Dr. King and AADI um, for, for spearheading this. Um, it, it was great to see Dr. Shu and, and Dr. Ganda um, on this call, longtime friends. And so, and, but most of all, once again, thank all of you for, for being here today. It was, it's, you know, it's heartening and, and very uplifting, and inspiring to see all of you here today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you here again next year um, in person for the, uh, the Evelyn and Lawrence Wing Family Lectureship. Well, thank you, uh, uh, 
um, call you Lever, if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> I don't have a title. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Choi, thank you again for a great lecture. We'll collect the questions and uh, send it to you. And then you could, uh, hopefully, you're will, willing to uh, answer it for everybody. I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be happy to. Okay. And thank you. And uh, 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 celebrate the Asian American Month. Bye-bye. Uh, Taste of ginger, everybody. Go to Taste of Ginger. Taste of ginger, that's right. <laughs> Bye.